Actually, one of the points that I make in the chapter is that learning is an inherently individual thing. The idea that you're going to put everybody in a class and everybody's going to go at the same rate, that's absolute fiction. No matter how much you try to pre-select to get the right bunch of students in the same class, it never works out. You have one guy who has difficulty factoring polynomials. You have another guy who has difficulty figuring out the slope of a line. The best way to educate people is to have it be individual. In other words, you have a syllabus, turn it into a check sheet, and have the person go at his own rate. And of course, there's a teacher who could be thought more as a supervisor to see that he goes through the curriculum at whatever rate. So this idea that everybody's going to graduate in June or May, it's an outmoded, dysfunctional idea. The better way to do it is you have the whole syllabus on a check sheet. You give the guy the check sheet, he writes his name on it, he goes down and does each thing. As he does it, he checks it off, or the teacher checks it off, or signs it. And when he gets to the end, he graduates. Doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the week or not. That's the right way to do it. I'm joined today by Jim Marshall, the author of Septemics, who will guide us through the seven levels of the scale of scholarship, exploring the depths of learning and education. Jim, please introduce yourself and then we can transition seamlessly into the conversation to shed light on the scale of scholarship and its profound impact on the learning journey. Okay, I am the discoverer of hitherto unknown natural phenomena which greatly aid in the understanding of people, from which I constructed a revolutionary practical philosophic system called Septemics and published it in the book, Septemics Hierarchies of Human Phenomena. And so they were going to look at one of the scales in that book. That's great, Jim. Can you provide an overview of this framework and how it structures the scale of scholarship? Okay, like all Septemic scales, has seven levels, and this is extremely important to everyone because everyone is a student. Even if you've never set foot in a school, you learn something. For example, the Native Americans, they didn't have schools in the sense that we know. They knew all kinds of things, of very elaborate and complicated things about nature, the forest, the animals, hunting, and all of that. Your success is largely dependent on your ability to learn. Intelligence is often defined as the ability to learn. This scale is about that. It goes through the seven levels. So this is relevant to everyone. Of course, it's obviously relevant to anyone who is a student at the time. So this is a linear scale, meaning there's no apparent congruence between levels one and seven. It's a gradual scale, meaning there's an infinitude of gradations between each of the levels, and it's a general scale, meaning once you find your level on the scale or another person's level on the scale, you're done. It's not context-driven. There's no context in this. Now, you might say, what about if a person has one ability to study math and science and another ability to study English and, and literature? That could be a contextual application. But this is understood to be a general condition. In other words, the way this actually plays out in the real world, a person is at a specific level and that's it. It doesn't usually break down to subject matter or anything like that. Now, what are we measuring with this scale? If you look at the dotted vertical line on the right, we're measuring interest. This is all about interest. The better students are the more interested students and the poorer students are the less interested students. So this goes from minimal interest to maximal interest. So let's start at the bottom, the non-student. This is a new concept for most people. This explains a lot. When you have a guy in the classroom, he upsets the classroom, he doesn't do his assignments, he fools around in class, he cuts class, he's usually at this level, a non-student. His attitude toward scholarship is that he will not learn. He's not interested in learning. He's a non-student. Now you say, why is he in the classroom? There's a plethora of reasons why he could be in the classroom. Maybe his parents were wanting him to be there. Maybe he wants to meet girls. Maybe this is a good place for him to sell pot to the students. 
So there are a variety of ulterior motives that might lead somebody like this to be in the classroom. But I can assure you, having been involved in education from the age of three, that everyone will benefit from having this guy out of the class, including the student himself. A couple of questions come up in me. Yes. Um, in terms of some of the characteristics that you've defined in unveiling the non-student, how can educators identify and address this level effectively? Okay, identify and address the two different things. As far as identify, this is the guy who cuts up in the class. This is the guy who makes jokes. He's not compliant. He does not have a desire to learn. He has no intention of learning. It doesn't matter how good the teacher is. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. He has no interest in this. He's interested in maybe meeting girls or fixing his hot rod or robbing a store or whatever somebody like this would do. He's not interested in learning and he will not learn no matter what you do. In your, in your experience, how does the educational system handle non-students? Are there any strategies that might be employed to encourage a willingness to learn? First of all, encouraging a willingness to learn in a non-student is a complete waste of time right. because there is no willingness to learn. Zero times a thousand is still zero. So there's nothing to encourage there. These guys get in a lot of trouble. They're sent to the principal's office. They get suspended, which if they get suspended, they're happy. From my point of view, as a serious scholar and as uh, a lover of education, the main thing about this guy is he disrupts the learning environment. He is the troublemaker in the classroom because he's not there to learn. He's there to make fun of the teacher. He plays pranks because he has no desire to learn. Now, I should mention that a scholar is a synonym of student. A student comes from the Latin word studere, which means to desire. Someone who desires learning, that is what interest is. Interest is the desire to learn. So the etymology of the word student totally dovetails with the synonym of student. So a person who has a high interest is a person who desires to learn. That's what interest is. So this guy has minimal interest. Now, I could have said he has no interest, but that's an absolute, and I try to stay away from absolutes. There's a world-famous writer who's now retired who dropped out of high school and was working in a menial job, was very poor, and finally said, this is terrible. I, I can't live like this. He went back to school. He finished high school. And the long and short of it is he eventually got a doctorate he went to Harvard, he went to University of Chicago, and he became a world-famous writer. The non-student might not be a stupid person, but he's just not willing to learn. This is a troublemaker, a troubled person. A lot of these people have something wrong. They have a very low IQ, or they come from a very disturbed home where there's a lot of emotional tra trauma in them. So there's something really wrong with this person. Some of them are moronic. This idea that everybody of a certain age should be in school, it doesn't work. It's better to, to let this guy out of school and get a menial job sweeping out a store and see what that is like. Maybe that will stimulate his interest. I think I'm going to go back and get my high school diploma because then more people will want to hire me. That might work with the guy. So the main thing about this is trying to teach this person is banging your head against a brick wall. The wall will win every time. You're not going to get anywhere. It's possible for this non-student to later not be a non-student. He may move to a higher level. He might get some motivation. He might say, I'm not really interested, but I have to have a high school diploma so that I can get a job in a bank or something like that. There's clearly the behavioral and the cognitive aspects, but what about the environmental aspect? Is the environment compatible to learn for a student at this level? Are you talking about the classroom environment? Yeah. The classroom is there to teach students, and a student, by definition, is someone who wants to learn. So if you have somebody there who doesn't want to learn, he's a non-student. He, he doesn't belong in the room. The way to handle this person is just get rid of him. Just expel him. It's all right, go off, do whatever you're going to do. It's not going to do any good anyway because he's not going to learn. One of the things that has happened in recent decades in American education, I don't know about other countries, but in American education, is they have dumbed down the requirements. 
if you can sign your name, you get a diploma. And that is counterproductive. That's why I say, if you get rid of these guys, the class will do better. The rest of the students will do better. The teacher will not be distracted. You won't have to waste time disciplining him. The teacher winds up saying, where's your assignment? Oh, the dog ate it. So there's nothing good about having a non-student in the classroom. If you try to tutor this person, if he shows up at all, you're not going to get anywhere because he will not learn. There are many young people today who ridicule people who are good students. They literally ridicule them. How does that help anything? The way to handle this person is to just get him out of the classroom environment until he changes his tune. If at some point he decides that he wants to do this, maybe he'll get his high school equivalency diploma. That takes some interest in order to do that. That's the non-student. Not a lot of these. It's a small percentage, but they're there. And these are the troublemakers. This might be an aside, but dovetails into this whole scale of scholarship. Because there's a curriculum and then there's an education. You talked about lowering the bar. The term curriculum is from the Latin curera, which means to run or to traverse. I believe they used it in Roman times for a course or a race or a chariot. And over time, it's evolved to encompass a set of courses and content and activities. The word education has the roots in Latin, meaning to draw out educere. Right. Education involves the process of imparting knowledge, skills, and values, and cultural understanding to individuals to foster intellectual, moral, and social development, and preparing individuals to be a responsible citizen in the various aspects of their life. My argument is there seems to be a growing concern that the emphasis on adhering to a predetermined curriculum often takes precedence over facilitating genuine education. The adherence to a curriculum can result in, in a form of indoctrination where students are primarily taught to conform to prescribed content rather than cultivating critical thinking, creativity, and a comprehensive understanding of the subject matter. I wonder if what is happening is the education system is more about fulfilling an economic imperative by following a curriculum as distinct from getting a real education. I agree. Actually, one of the points that I make in the chapter is that learning is an inherently individual thing. The idea that you're going to put everybody in a class and everybody's going to go at the same rate, that's absolute fiction. No matter how much you try to pre-select to get the right bunch of students in the same class, it never works out. You have one guy who has difficulty factoring polynomials. You have another guy who has difficulty figuring out the slope of a line. The best way to educate people is to have it be individual. So in other words, you have a syllabus, you turn it into a check sheet, and have the person go at his own rate. And of course, there's a teacher who could be thought of more as a supervisor to see that he goes through the curriculum at whatever rate. So this idea that everybody's going to graduate in June or May, it's an outmoded, dysfunctional idea. The better way to do it is you have the whole syllabus on a check sheet. You give the guy the check sheet. He writes his name on it. He goes down and does each thing. As he does it, he checks it off, or the teacher checks it off, or signs it. And when he gets to the end, he graduates. doesn't matter if it's in the middle of the week or not. That's the right way to do it, because then it's tailored to the person. So you could have one student get stuck on A, another student get stuck on B, another student get stuck on C. If you do it in an individual way, that doesn't happen. The ubiquity of computers opens the way to do this. Everything is on the computer, and the student works with the computer. He does Okay, read this. Okay, now do this exercise. Now take this little quiz. And it's like he's going through this at his own rate. And the teacher's there to answer his questions and keep him going. That's the right way to do it. So up from minimal interest, a little more above that is what we call the facile student. This is something that most people don't know about. The facile student is covert. This is pretended learning. Now, this guy might cheat on the exam, or he might figure out some way, even without cheating, to pass the exam. 
but doesn't really learn anything. This is the guy you'll bump into years later and he'll say, oh yeah, I took algebra. I don't remember anything from it. That's the fast house student. He passed algebra. He doesn't remember anything. How would you as an educator discern between genuine learning and the mere appearance of it in facile students? The facile student is a sneak. He just says to him, Rodney, did you read the chapter on Christopher Columbus? He says, yeah, he didn't read it. So whatever device he uses to get through the course, it's covert. It's pretended learning. Now, the way to detect these people is by application. In other words, can the guy actually do the thing? That's what examinations are supposed to be about. An examination, you're supposed to find out, does this guy actually know it? Now, the problem is, if you teach without really any application, a person can regurgitate the information without ever really imbibing it, which in itself is an odd concept. But that's what these people do. They're sneaky people. They're just getting through the course. He wants to have a lot of money. He knows in order for him to have a lot of money, he's got to get a college degree. So in order to get a college degree, he's got to get a high school diploma. He's got this all worked out, and he's just going through these phony steps. He's not there to learn. It's pretended learning. He's not really learning anything. Some of this you can get in an examination. Most of these facile students have figured out some way to get around that, whether it's with crib notes or hiring somebody else to write your term paper or some mental trick they do where they learn it enough to pass the test, but it doesn't really impinge on them. For example, one thing I've noticed, having been around Christians, there are many Christians, even clergy, who do not practice Christianity. Didn't you read the Bible? Didn't you read what Jesus said? And ostensibly they did, but they're not doing that. And I have known many of these people where you expect clergy to be kind, benevolent, helpful people. Many of them are not. Many of them are mean, unpleasant people. They obviously, in some sense, pretended to learn this. Even if they can recite it verbatim, they didn't get it. They didn't imbibe it. Or, or to use Robert Heinlein's term, they didn't grok it from stranger in a strange land. Mm. So that's a real student. He grokks it. He gets it. It's, it's part of his personality now. Rastelson is like the duck where the water just runs off his back. It doesn't permeate his feathers at all. So he's going through the motions and he doesn't learn anything. So the problem with this person is detecting him. How do we detect this person? Now, if you're doing class education as is done commonly, it's very easy for this guy to fake his way through. There's all kinds of subterfuges that somebody like this will do. This is the type of person who might play up to the teacher to get the teacher to like him so that the teacher will give him a better grade than he really deserves. That's another type of pretense that might go into this. So this is a dishonest person. The non-student is not dishonest. He just says, don't bother me, go away. I don't want to hear about it. The facile student plays along. He's going through the motions and he doesn't learn anything. You ask him about a year later, this guy passed calculus. You ask him, what's an integral? He says, I don't remember. If you pass calculus, you know what an integral is for the rest of your life. That's the fast house student. That is a problem. They're trying to figure out, does this guy actually know something? One of the ways to do this, and you know, I've worked with hundreds of students as a tutor or a coach, and I will ask the person about specific words. I will not ask them, do you know what this word means? Because they're going to say yes. I will say, what is the definition of antediluvian? And if I don't have a correct definition in one second, I say, let's look it up. Open the dictionary. Here it is. Read it. And then after he reads it, I'll say, okay, now tell me, what is the definition of antediluvian? And if he doesn't give me a direct answer, then I start going in and saying, well, what word in this definition did you understand? So that's one way to pierce this, by getting into the basics. You could find some engineering or science student and say, what's the definition of electron? He can't give you a straight answer. How is he going to know physics if he can't define an electron? Again, don't say, do you know what an electron is? He's going to say yes. Say, what is the definition of the word electron? And if he doesn't have it in one second, you make him look it up. If you do this, 
five or six or 10 times. And the guy can't define any of these things. He's a, he's a fast house student. He's not getting any of it. So then you have to get busy and get into this. Don't you want to learn this subject? Why are you in this course? The school requires me to take this. So there's a lot of reasons why he might be in the room. Even though his body is in the room, his mind is not. He doesn't really get it. He never gets it. So this is a problem in education, the widespread issue. And as I said, the main problem is identifying this person as a facile student. You say, Smith, go up to the whiteboard and, and do this algebra problem. And you watch him do it. Now, if he can do it, okay, he knows how to do it. But uh, often the fast house student won't know how to do it. That's like you're getting into some application there. You have to consult application. So this shows up in things like, let's say you're teaching somebody how to repair refrigerators. You can make a good living if you know how to fix refrigerators. The guys in the course, you say to him, okay, we have this refrigerator here. It doesn't work. If you can identify this person, there's going to be a fall from grace. In other words, he's going around with this phony facade that he knows this subject. And when you pierce that, suddenly is revealed that he doesn't know it. So it gets into psychological issues. This could be a very painful experience for this person. There are many students who really don't have any real understanding of learning. They get stuck in this class when they're five years old, and they just go through these motions. Okay, now I'm going to write the letter A. Now I'm going to write the letter B. And it just goes forward year after year. And there's really nobody paying attention, which is why I had a career as a tutor fixing the messes made by mainstream education. The schools would totally screw up these kids. Kids would come to me. He's failing algebra. Okay, so I would straighten it out. I have to first figure out what does he know? What doesn't he know? Then I have to figure out how to explain it to him. It's like detective work. This takes some real attention. This sort of cookie cutter approach to education really fails this is the guy, he graduates the course, and he doesn't know anything. He takes a course in American history, and he asks him, who is the 16th president of the United States? He doesn't know. You can spot these people because they will boast about this. They will say, oh, yeah, I, I passed geometry. I don't remember anything. What a waste of time that was. It's like boasting that he did a snow job on the teacher, which is what you get from a dishonest person. See, a normal person wouldn't want to do that. He would not boast that he disingenuously fooled the teacher. That's not normal behavior. But we're talking about a dishonest person. This is like the type of person who might grow up to be a corrupt politician, where he's figuring out some scheme to siphon off tax money into his Swiss bank account. It's the same type of person. They know how to use facilitation and manipulation because uh, there's a fine line between those two things. They can slide from one to the other according to whatever they're presented with. Yeah. And the reason they call the facile student is you can ask this person a question and he will give you a facile response. He's just regurgitating it. Mm. He doesn't really understand it. It didn't really connect with him. He can recite often didn't really penetrate into his mind. He didn't really get it. So that's what White's called FASA. He seems to know the material, but he really doesn't. If he, it's using the brain as data storage. You can vomit out an answer, but you haven't really aligned to it. The content isn't part of your basic constitution. It's something you can recite without right. any real alignment to the facts, to the energy of it, to the content of it. Yeah. See, he does not really fit the definition of a student because remember student comes from studere which means to desire he doesn't desire to learn he's not there with rapt attention hanging on every word of the teacher he doesn't fit the definition of education because educare means to lead out nobody's leading him out you can't contact this person he's a phony i don't know if american tv but there was a show called leave it to beaver in the 50s and there was a character named Eddie Haskell. Have you ever heard of this? No, tell me about it. Eddie Haskell was an egregiously disingenuous person. So when he spoke to the parents of his friend, he was, hello, Mr. Cleaver. How are you today? Oh, and how is your lovely wife? But as soon as the father left the room, he said, come on, man, let's go get some pie. He was a complete phony, which was 
was funny about that character was he was a fast student in a sense. He was completely phony. But when you get this in a classroom, if you imagine Eddie Haskell in a classroom, mm. good afternoon, Mrs. Smith. You look <laughs> lovely in your blouse today. He's just laying it on to try to get a passing grade. A normal student wouldn't do that. He would just go in and open his book and pay attention. Most Americans, especially people of my generation, they all know who Eddie Haskell is. You hard to not smile when you hear the name Eddie Haskell. He went through the series for five or six years just being disingenuous all the time. And then when the parents weren't around, he was a real troublemaker. The next one up, poor student. A poor student does not like to learn. Why doesn't he like to learn? Because he's a poor student. Why is he a poor student? Because he doesn't like to learn. This guy has more interest than a fast South student, but he still has trouble. There are a variety of reasons why he could be a poor student. But you can fix this guy because you can spot poor students. How many people live in New York City? And he says, I don't know. If you're studying the state of New York history and geography, that would be a question that would come up. You can see that he's a poor student because he doesn't know. He's not a phony at all. He really is a poor student. A lot of attention gets paid to this person by the parents and by the teachers. Now, the problem is they don't really know how to fix him. But I tell you in the chapter how to do that. If you want to find out how to fix him, you have to get the book. And I give explicit directions how to make the person a better student. There's lots of these people around and you can spot them. They're very different from the fast house students. The fast house student might actually be getting better grades than the poor student. But he's so sneaky that he somehow figures out how to con the teacher, whether it's by cheating on the exam or whatever. He seems like he knows what he's talking about, but he doesn't. You say to him, do you know how to factor this polynomial? He says, no, I don't know how to do it. Well, do you know what a polynomial is? No. So this guy is identified as a slow student. Many parents will put him into some sort of remedial tutoring to try to fix this. Up from that is the average student. The average student is willing to learn. Studere means desire. He's willing to learn. So that makes him an average student. Demographically, this is your largest group. So what you don't want to do with this guy is anything to discourage him. There's all kinds of things that go on. Teachers who ridicule the students, teachers who have particular students they dislike or using corporal punishment. There's a variety of things you can do to an average student that will make him a poor student by crushing his willingness to learn. How do you avert the potential decline in the willingness of an average student to learn if educators are unintentionally or intentionally diminishing their willingness by undermining them? If the teachers are dimin diminishing the willingness, that's it. The student thing is going to deteriorate. It goes on all the time. When we get to higher levels, there are some students who are somewhat immune to that type of abuse. Let's go up to level three. This is the good student. The good student learns well. It's not easy to discourage this guy because he's a good student. See, even if the teacher is a jerk, he learns well. It's not going to be easy to discourage him because he is already a good student. He has some academic armor on him that allows him to fend off the predations that might damage the average student. He's somewhat immune to that. That was a good student. And some teachers are real jerks. I just saw, okay, this is something wrong with this guy. He doesn't like me or whatever. I just went on. I just went on. I did the best I could and didn't allow it to discourage me. I just figured, yeah, this guy's a jerk and I got stuck with a lemon here. I've experienced it myself. In terms of a depth of inquiry and being able to go beyond the surface level understanding, and it's nourishing that depth of inquiry. That's the way I felt about it in terms of being the good student because I wanted to get a deeper penetration into the subject so I could get, have a better purchase on the different variables and aspects of those things as distinct from having a bog standard answer that you can just vomit out without any understanding. The good student is not gonna be discouraged as easily as the average student because he learns well. If you go through the education system, starting from kindergarten all the way up to graduating, getting a bachelor's degree, you're going to have maybe 100 different teachers. 
the odds of getting a lemon are very high. You're going to get a few guys who don't belong there, who are not good teachers, not nice people. You have to be able to separate that out, withstand the predation, and learn anyway. Many good students say something like, I did not learn because of the teachers. I learned despite the teachers. I had that attitude through much of my education. I'm here to learn this. I'm not going to let this jerk prevent me from learning this. It's like when you play football, you wear pads, so you're protected. Like I was dressed for football in the classroom. So all these things that happened from bad principals and biased teachers and other things, it just bounced off me. If you try to play football and you don't have your gear on, you're going to get killed in the first 10 minutes. You're going to be in the hospital. I had that armor. I had the same math teacher two years in a row. This guy was a brilliant math teacher. He wasn't just good. He was brilliant. He was like the Picasso of math teachers. He was a horrible person. He was clearly anti-Semitic. And he did really nasty things to the students. And he would sabotage the students. So I just said, okay, I'm not going to let this stop me. This is the teacher I have. I'm good at math. I'm here to learn. I like to learn. I'm going to learn. So I just ignored all that crap. I'll tell you what this guy did to us. So we show up in trigonometry junior year. The guy gets up first day. Almost the first thing he said, gives his name. He says, oh, I know that many of you boys here are on the football team. There were six of us in that class that were on the football team. I know you have to practice every day. Don't worry. I'm not going to fail you. So we all looked at one another and smiled. So the marking period ended. He failed every one of us, all six of us. He set us up. It was like a sting. How can I screw these guys? He tells you he's going to pass you and then doesn't. That's sabotage. I and all my friends, we were all very good students. We were shocked, aghast at what had been done to us. When you go to a tough school, if a teacher tells you that, there's a tendency to slack off a little and to work on other subjects more where they hadn't told you that. I still became... A, a mathematician despite that. I just didn't allow that to just deter me. Well, let's go to the next level. The very good student, he, he doesn't merely learn well. He likes to learn. This is fun for him. He enjoys learning. Oh boy, we're going to learn about Abraham Lincoln today. Yippee! He's smiling and happy and taking it all in. He doesn't pay attention to the guy who's disrupting the class. He doesn't pay attention to the teacher who's going to sabotage him. Obviously, that is a minority of students who actually like to learn. But a lot of that depends on what type of the school you're in. If you get into an elite school where you have to take a test to get into the school, there's much more of these. If you're in a public school, would they let anybody in? Not so many. So this person, why does he like to learn? Because his interest is high. That is the definition of a student. He desires to learn. That is what interest means. Interest is the desire to learn. Oh, I'm interested in this. He's telling you he wants to learn it. That's what a student is by definition. In your book, you mentioned that the very good students may not requ require a traditional teacher, but rather a manager. And I'm really curious about this. Can you elaborate without giving everything away on the distinction between teaching and managing in this context? Sure. You may be aware that homeschooling in recent decades has been burgeoning. The numbers of students in the United States who are homeschooled goes up every year. Well, that would be very difficult for a student who did not like to learn. The parents, in a sense, are managing this. Okay, here's your math workbook. We're on page 15 today. I want you to go through page 15, okay, and then show it to me. Okay, he goes through, he does the math problems. The mom looks at it. Oh, yeah, you got it all right. Very good. Let's go to page 16. That's more managing it than being a teacher. So a lot of that goes on in homeschooling. Now, there are many homeschooled students who are really motivated to learn, and the parents have to do very little, if anything, because everything is on the Internet now. Let's say you want to learn French. There must be 100 different apps now, how to learn French on the Internet. You go through it, finish that one, go to another one. Go through that one. You do this for a year or two and you're speaking French. That goes back to what I said about learning is inherently individual. It is not group activity. Sticking people in a group, any kind of a group, and because the non-students are there, the facile students are there, the poor students are stumbling along, not getting it, etc. 
Let's talk about the avid student. You mentioned homeschooling, and I see that here as a movement. But I also see it in one sense as a source of optimism. Um, wondering how the scale contributes to assessing and improving educational practices, especially in the context of homeschooling. Anybody who gets this scale and reads the chapter is going to be empowered to homeschool their children because I tell you how to do it. You just have to know how to do it. Clearly, the people in the education establishment don't know the data in this chapter. It's not a subtle point. They clearly don't know. When homeschooling first started, the students who were homeschooled were looked down upon. Oh, you homeschooled? We don't want you in our college. But after a while, it became known to the admissions departments that the homeschooled students were the better students. It became a plus. Oh, this guy was homeschooled. Yeah, we want him because that's somebody who's going to be high on this scale. So that has changed. They figured it out. I'll tell you something else. When you go to the very good schools, the elite schools. Now, when I say elite, maybe I shouldn't use that word. The schools that are serious schools, they're not party schools. Ivy not League not. schools. Not necessarily Ivy League, because the Ivy League has deteriorated in recent years. But a good school, a good, tough school, a school where it's hard to get in. And when you get out, the fact that you graduated there is a plus on your resume. Those people in those schools are smarter than the people in the quotidian state schools. So what will happen is you'll have often a homeschool will apply to one of these inferior schools, get rejected, apply to a much better school and get accepted. That goes on because the people in the better schools are smarter. That's why it's a better school. The admissions people have figured this out. Oh, this guy is homeschooled. They look at his SATs and bing, he's in. Whereas a lot of people in the state schools or the lower level schools, they haven't figured this out yet. They're not smart enough to see this. So they say homeschool rejected, which is a huge mistake because he could have been one of their better students. He could have been one of the Nobel Prizes that brought mm. fame to the school. The avid student loves to learn. It's like eating an ice cream sundae or kissing Marilyn Monroe. This kid has maximal interest. Now, of course, the higher you go, the more of these you find. So if you get to graduate school, there's quite a few of these around. Guys pursuing a graduate degree in physics, that's not an easy thing to do. That guy is going to be high on this scale. He's motivated because he's interested. He loves to learn. Needless to say, demographically across society, there aren't too many of these. So that's how this works. Do you want me to talk about how to make a better student? Absolutely. The first thing you have to realize that is almost totally ignored in mainstream education is the student needs to know the meaning of the words and the symbols that are being used. That is almost totally ignored. There should be a course starting in the first grade and running all the way through your bachelor's degree of vocabulary, just vocabulary, where you study words. It's almost like studying the dictionary. And of course, it's done on a gradient. That would do more than anything else because people would know the, the definition of the words. Teachers use words all the time. They never bother to define them. Now, if you look in my book, you'll see there is a glossary, not only in front of every chapter, even in front of the introduction. So I'm telling you the specific meanings of the words that are being used. So that doesn't happen. That's the first thing that would have to happen is you have to focus on vocabulary. So you go into Latin, right? The first week they say agricola, farmer. Okay, that's agricola. You know that word. You take that and expand it through every level of education that should be there. I'm not talking about as a substitute for English. You can have English where you're mostly learning grammar and reading and literature. But one of the things that's been going on in education is the teachers force the kids to read words when the student doesn't even know what it means. They make us just sound it out phonetically and go on. That's completely wrong. The kid gets to a word. He doesn't know the word. He can't pronounce it. What does it mean? I don't know. Stop. Look up the word. That's the first thing you have to do. Now, of course, does it slow down the progress? It depends on how you look at it. This is why it should be individualistic. Because one guy doesn't know what one word means. Another guy doesn't know what another word means. They do not all have the same unknowns in their vocabulary. 
That is a huge factor. I was a science, math, and engineering student. Nothing was ever said about vocabulary. They expect you to just figure it out. You get into arithmetic. Okay. What is absolute value? They don't really define absolute. They don't really define value. And they don't really define absolute value. So when the kid runs into it, he doesn't really know what to do with it. This has to be done in every subject at every level. I remember you saying prior to writing this book, you carried an unabridged dictionary with you. For 15 years, I carried an unabridged dictionary with me. When I looked at the glossary, and I, I love words, finding out what they actually mean and the etymology and so on. When you understand the definition, where it might lead and what it might connect to, as distinct from just being able to sound out the word without really knowing what it means. So the significance of that means it can lead you into getting a much deeper penetration into that word and its significance and then what it can connect to. One word can spring 20 things. I would advocate the whole education system expanding it by one hour a day. In the United States, school generally ends at three o'clock. It could go to four o'clock or start it at eight o'clock instead of nine o'clock and have that extra hour just vocabulary. One of the reasons that you see these stupid kids using slang is that they don't know real English. If you listen to these lower socioeconomic kids, they speak in some strange language. It's not really English. What the hell are they talking about? It's because they don't know English, because nobody ever taught it to them. If you know the actual English words, you use them. You don't have to make up some street lingo. That is a sign to me of ignorance. And I'm a serious scholar. I listen to educated people, and they don't speak like that. They speak the king's English because they took the time to learn it. These high school dropouts who were involved in promiscuity and drugs and alcohol, they didn't do that. They just have this street language they use because they don't know the regular language. Yeah. So let me go to the, the next thing about how to help the student. A deal is a skipped gradient. Never let a student skip a gradient. Again, this would have to be done individualistically. Very often you see the teacher saying, most of you don't know how to calculate the slope of a line, but we have to move on. And they go to the next subject. That's completely wrong. You're teaching algebra. They have to know how to calculate the slope of a line, period. If it's done individualistically, that will happen. The guy's working from the checklist. It tells him how to do it. He has exercises. If he gets stuck, teacher helps him. At some point, he gets it, and then he goes on. Now, the next guy might get that in 15 seconds, so he's further ahead. So maybe he will finish the course sooner. If you can get algebra in six weeks, great. Then we'll put you in geometry. Why does it have to be a fixed two semesters of 13 weeks each? It's arbitrary. All of this goes back to the old one-room schoolhouse in America on the frontier. The townspeople would throw up a building, put a stove in it, hire the, what they call a school marm, and there would be kids in there who were anything four to 18 in the same room together. And so that's how they learned. That's before we had public education. Established public education came later. Of course, now they've gotten segregated by ages or grades, but even it still doesn't work because you're going to have skipped gradients. So you have to catch the guy. When the guy doesn't understand something, when he doesn't know something, fix it. Don't let him go on because that is a blind spot he's leaving behind. And eventually it's going to get him. It's going to show up on the test and he's going to not know it. We have to understand that all good teaching is done by gradients. There's a certain way to teach any subject. And the good teachers know how to do that. So you have some guy who's been teaching geometry for 20 years. He knows how to teach geometry. This is what a point is. This is what a line is. This is what a plane is. And you go forward from there. There's a sequence. To it. Mm. So that's putting the gradients in. But still, anytime you put students in a class, they're going to be skipped gradients. Because even though the teacher might want to help the students having trouble, the establishment does not allow that. The principal will say, look, Smith, you've got a syllabus to get through here. 
you're on the seventh week and you're only on the fifth week of your syllabus. You got to get through this syllabus. They're pressuring the teacher to force the students to stick gradients. If the student does not skip the gradient, he will get it. You have to pay attention to the gradient the person is on because even the best students are going to get stuck on certain things. You're trying to teach somebody about chemistry and we get down to isotopes and he doesn't get it and you just go on. Isotopes, an unknown word, and every time it comes up, it's like a dull spot in his mind. He doesn't know what it is really. That's a mistake in teaching. That's the next thing. The third thing is you have to have application. You have to have it real. I tell my math students, write it down. Now, I had the ability, because I was a math whiz, to look at a math problem, solve it in my mind, and then just write it out on paper and hand it in. Most people are not like that. Most people, okay, we're going to solve this. What's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, we have to isolate the variable. Let's see you do that. Okay, so why on one side, you get everything else on the other side. Okay, write it down. See, don't let them just say isolate the variable. Write it down because it's putting it into the real world. You want to have maps, images, pictures. This is why laboratory science is lionized. When you take laboratory science, you're actually doing real things. When you do chemistry the first semester, you have to pass qualitative analysis, period. If you don't get that, you don't graduate. And the next semester, you have to quantitative analysis, okay? It's a real-world thing. They give you a beaker. And realize not everybody has the same beaker, right? But the teacher knows who gets what. They say, now you tell us what is in that beaker. You have to get it right. This is where the facile student falls on his face. Can't do it. In physics, they have demonstrations. Uh, in engineering school, they had a whole course called engineering mechanics, which was just taking devices used in engineering and showing you how to use them. Boy, was that useful. Oh, here's a vernier caliper. Here's how you use it. Oh, we're going to calculate the distance around this lake. Wow. See, it's real. You have to do that. You can't read a book about driving and not drive the car. If you're stepping into the halls of academia, you've got to be able to humanize it into application. Right. Otherwise, yeah. it's just an academic perusal. Right. So I get the student to say the thing. Today, we're going to teach you about inversions. Can you say inversion? The student says inversion. Okay, now I'm going to tell you what an inversion is. Then I say, okay, come to the keyboard. I'm going to show you an inversion. Okay, now you play an inversion. And you see it's real to them. It's there on the keyboard. They get it. That's what you want then that is in that person's mind. It becomes a part of him. You have to have application. You have to have three-dimensional things. It can't just be words in a book or words on a screen. It doesn't work. It has to be real. And one way or another, you have to have application. It's what I call shelf development, Jim. Shelf development. I never heard that term before. <laughs> As distinct from self-development, if you look in the new age world people are reading books on mindfulness and they can talk about it but do they actually practice it or they go right. to a seminar and they've got the workshop notes and all the rest of it but it ends up on the shelf right that's okay. right that's why septemics as i emphasize throughout the book this is for use mm. use it the way to introduce somebody to this is you Help him solve a real-world problem with the scale. So the dad sees the kids having trouble in school. He says, Junior, come over here. Look at this. Kid looks at the scale of scholarship. He knows he's a scholar. Let's say the kid's 13 years old. He knows he's a scholar, and he knows he's having trouble in school. And he's going to say, you mean there's a scale of scholarship? And the dad says, yeah. Where are you on the scale? Kid's going to want to know that. And you go through a whole process about how you find your level. When he finds his level, he's going to be very happy with it. doesn't matter what it is. When he finds it correctly, now I see what's going on. And the dad can help him to move up to the next level. This kid just used this septemic scale to better his life. At some point, he's going to say to his dad, where did you get this? What is this book? And the dad's going to say, here, read it. That's the way to get somebody interested in septemics. Because if you just talk to them, it does no good.
they are impervious because it's a totally new subject. So you have a guy, he's having trouble with his girlfriend. You say, come here, Fred, let me show you this. You help him solve his relationship with his girlfriend. He says, thanks. Now I understand what's going on. And at some point he's going to say, does this work on other things too? Yes. Read the book. You can get an ebook for 10 bucks. Really? 10 bucks? That's it? So he downloads it. See, that's how you get the person into it. By having him actually use it in his life. Because then he sees, wow, this is real. This solved the problem for me. This isn't some abstraction. We already have too many abstractions. So this book is a handbook. One of the reviewers said in his review, you should carry this book with you everywhere you go. I don't know if you saw that review. I saw it, yeah. Uh, I didn't come up with that or suggest that or anything. I didn't. That was like a new idea to me. You can see this guy is actually going around with this book and fixing things in his life. The brother comes over and says, oh, I'm really bummed out. My girl left me. Really? Come here. Let me help you with this. He gets out the book. See? Helps them find their level on their appropriate scale. Now the guy is happy. He can go back and save the relationship. Or maybe he's going to say, I'm done with her. Whatever he decides to do with it, he's going to be happy about it because it's inside sight. He sees what's going on. And every time a person has insight, that's what education is about, isn't it? I would be in class and I would have an epiphany. Oh, yeah, that's what the Napoleonic era was about. Now I get it. You see it in three dimensions. It's not just some guy from Corsica. It's a whole thing going on with the whole continent of Europe involved in this thing. One off years and millions of people. It's a whole big Megilla. That's what should happen in class. A good teacher, he will get that from you. Let's say you're reading literature. You read with Becky Sharp, and the teacher talks to you about it. What did you think of this book? Tell me about Becky Sharp. And you have realizations, and you get it. Oh, yeah, now I see what this is about. That's what education is supposed to be, where you have enlightenment going on, where you actually have a cognitive chain in your internal world. So that is what education is. Education is just not regurgitating something. It changes you. Like when I read Der Zoberberg by Thomas Mann, okay? Brilliant German writer. Of course, I read it in translation. It changed me. That brilliant teacher spent a whole month with us going over that novel, thousand page novel, a whole month. So by the end of that month, I really got this. I was in love with this guy. That's education. In order to do that, you have to know what the words mean. You have to not skip any gradients and have something in the real world that connects to it. That is why class participation is significant. If the teacher says, tell me, Johnson, what is Huckleberry Finn about? That puts the kid on the spot and he has to come up with an answer. So it's in the real world. Mm -hmm. He has to stand up and tell everybody. It puts pressure on it. And that's part of the learning process, that pressure. That is another way of getting it into the real world. That is why many teachers pay attention to class participation. You have some guy in the back, never raises his hand, never asks a question. And if you ask him something, he has a minimalist comment. Huckleberry Finn, well, it's about a kid named Huckleberry Finn. That's his answer. Meanwhile, this is probably the most important novel of the American 19th century writers. What's Moby Dick about? Oh, it's a story about a fish. Not even a fish. You have to get the kid because when he verbalizes it, it makes it real. That's why I say to my students, write it down when you're doing this. I'll say, okay, show me how we're going to solve this calculus problem. And I'll say, don't tell me about it. Do it. I want to see this on paper. And he writes it. If he writes it, I say, very good. You got it. What do we do next? Now I have to isolate the variable. Okay, great. Don't tell me. Do it. Show me. I want to see this on paper. And that's how you make a good math student. You get them to write it all down. It's the same thing with chemistry. You're solving chemical formulas. It has to be real. That's why laboratory science is significant. You're learning about resistance. You should actually have an ohmmeter there and measure some resistance. Get some resistors and put them on the ohmmeter. This is different from this one, you see? That has an impact on your psyche. If you do those three things, your students will go up that scale. How fast they go, that's a variable, but they will go up the scale. That's how you make an avid student. You just do those three things.
And of course, it's explained in greater detail in the book how to do it. It's not hard. You don't need to hire a tutor. You can do it yourself. You sit down with your kid and you say to him, okay, now I understand you're having trouble with this. Okay. What is the definition of the word quotidian? Let's look it up. Oh, that's what it means. Yeah. See, now I'll read the sentence again. Oh, now this makes sense to me. See, that's the first of the three things that I just articulated. So if you just keep doing those three things, you will make a student move up the scale. Now, will he get to the top of the scale? Maybe not. Depends on the person. My belief is that unless somebody has something organically wrong with his brain, you can make him an avid student if you just use this chapter. You can do it. It's just a question of time. I'll give you an example. I had a student who I was tutoring in English, and I had him study the synonym studies in the Thorndike Barnhart Advanced Dictionary. It's a 900-page dictionary. Every page on average has a synonym study. You get to the word red. And I'll say red, crimson, and so forth. It breaks down for big, large, gigantic, giant. And it gives you the subtlety of meaning, immense. And you learn what the differences between all these words are. I had this student go through the whole dictionary and do that. So by the time he got to the end, he knew the subtleties of the English language. See, most people think they're the same thing. They're not. They're two different meanings. Now, are they synonyms? Yes. But you have to realize that synonyms are words that have either the same meaning or almost the same meaning. It's exact, precise, measured. Yes. What I do is I, I create word piles. So I look at those piles of words and what, what the subtle differences are, and sometimes quite drastic differences, but they seem related in, in language when people use language. Is it precise? Is it exact? Or is it measured? But they're all different. That's but right. They... Yeah. Like in English, we say for. That is a structural definition. The thing literally has forks mm. in it. In Spanish, they say tenedor, which means holder. That is a whole different concept. So somebody can say tenedor means fork. If you look up the derivation of tenedor, it's a whole different way of describing this implement. The holder, it doesn't mean. So that goes to all language. That's how you become an avid student. That's how you become a serious scholar. The guys who really know their stuff, who become college professors, at least in their own subject, they've done that. If you talk to Jordan Peterson about synonyms, he will tell you enormous means this, but immense means this. He probably knows that. So he's Jordan Peterson. That's what the scale is about. I urge everyone to use it on yourself and on any student around you. Most people have kids and most kids are students and they all need that chapter because What's in that chapter is not in mainstream education. I don't mean to criticize teachers. I respect teachers. It's not their fault that they don't have this scale. But hopefully they'll see this and they'll get it and they'll read it. And they will be able to improve their students. So again, if you're locked into mainstream education, you're going to have somebody coming down on you because you're not getting through the syllabus. This happens all the time. Teacher says, I know you guys don't understand this, but we have to move on. That is not a good way to teach. So the whole system stinks. Isn't that a problem of mixed ability in a, in a large classroom whereby right. you standardize everything? Yes, but you have to realize even if there's only two students in the class, there's still mixed ability because this guy doesn't understand A and this guy doesn't understand B. Now, if they are at the top of the scale, it's a very good student. He can indemnify himself against the, the bad teaching because he likes to learn or he loves to learn. But if it's somebody near the bottom, he's just going to go down that scale and he's going to say, I hate this class. The reason he hates it is because there's all kinds of words that we use that he doesn't know the meanings of. He had all kinds of gradients skipped on him where he didn't know A and then he went on to B without knowing A. The third thing is, there was never any real application. I had a history teacher once, and he said to us, pour over map. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing to know in history. Look at the map of Europe. It's one thing in the 17th century. It's another thing in the 18th century. It's another thing in the 19th century. And you see these changes, and that's history. But you're looking at a, a diagram. So it puts it in the real world. Looking at a globe is even better because you can have a better perspective rather than flattening it out, which is 
not really the way reality is. So that was a very smart thing to say. Pour over Max. I learned this has something to do with geography. I see here's Scotland. One down here is England. Over here is Wales. Okay, now I see. Right there, you learned something about the history of the UK just by looking at that map. Because I'm sure there's millions of kids today that have no idea about that. They don't know these are all separate countries. At some point, we united. They have different languages and everything, different customs. Dialects. Yeah. I urge everybody, read the chapter. Use it on yourself and use it on your loved ones. And there will be benefit from it because you will be a smarter person. When you don't know something, it's like a black hole in your mind. Somebody says to you, meteorology. You don't even know what meteorology is. How are you going to process that? It's like a black hole in your mind. See? And these people are, oh, yeah, he's a meteorologist. What's that? Get on the internet, look it up. Oh, yeah, I see meteorology. Now you know what they're talking about. You have to do that. I do that every day of my life. Every day. That's the beauty of the search engine. I'm, I'm thinking about something like an actor that I, I watched who was a star of a t- big TV show, right? And then I never really saw him again. I thought, huh, I wonder what happened to him. I looked it up. He went on vacation and he drowned. That's why I never saw him again. <laughs> I was walking around for 30 years wondering what happened to this guy. Now I know. So that little black hole in my mind is no longer there. And that's how you get smart because Mm. all of these black holes in your mind make you dopey. The worst ones are misconceptions. I was talking to a friend of mine from China and she said, what's the difference between a Catholic and Christian? I was like, wow, this is a person from China who was not raised in that culture. I had to explain it. Originally, there was a Catholic church, and then there was a schism where it broke off, and you had Protestant. Oh, now I see. So you mean they're all Christians, but some of my Catholics? Yeah. She just had no clue at all about that. And then other people might think that Catholic and Christian mean the same thing, which they don't. And that makes real mischief, because Protestants are very different from Catholics. There were wars fought over that for many years. Many thousands of people were killed over that. So it's not a small thing. And if you have that misconception, you don't know what the hell is going on. They talk about fundamentalist Christian. You have to find out what Christian means. Then look up fundamentalist Christian. And then you see, oh, yeah, this is a voting block. See? But then you get that. You have no idea. What are they talking about? And so it makes you dopey because there is a difference between stupidity and ignorance, of course. But there's an awful lot of overlap in there. Because when you have a lot of misconceptions, they literally make you stupid. Literally. You need to clear up misconceptions, and search engines are great for that. Recently, I found out there was a war between Ohio and Michigan. Most people don't know that. Did you know that? No. Two states of the Union had a war. Wow. That explains why you have the Michigan, the so-called Upper Peninsula. It's a piece of land that's part of Michigan that is completely separated from it by water. Why is this peninsula up here part of Michigan? It's not even connected to it. Then you find out there was a war and that was a settlement in the war. Okay, we'll give you this and you give us that. That's how they settled it. For years, I wondered, why is this upper peninsula in Michigan? Then I finally looked it up. Now I understand where it came from, why it's that way. And knowledge is full of that. There's those billions and billions of those specifics. And if you're not interested, you're not going to find out and you're just going to be dopey. Somebody talks about the Upper Peninsula. You don't know what the hell they're talking about. What's this Upper Peninsula? What's oh, a part of Michigan? Really? That thing over there, that's part of Michigan? How can that be? It's not even connected to the state. The ignorance breeds stupidity. It has the effect of making you stupid because you don't understand. Ignorance is bliss, but it's also fatal. Yes. When you're young, you ask a lot of questions, but as you grow older, People stop asking questions. When you look at the symbology of a question mark, it's like a hook. It's not yeah. just a full stop. It's, there's a symbology. And if you're symbolically yeah. literate, you understand that question mark is to bring in another question, as distinct from getting a, an answer. You get mm-hmm. the answer, but you also get another question on the back of it. In general, human society is not getting smarter. Now, there is a tiny elite of people who are getting smarter, like 1%. But in general, especially in the United States, it's dumbing down. 
everywhere you look. The best evidence of that is trying to talk to a young person. They don't know what the hell you're talking about. You say to him, we passed the House of Representatives, but the Senate's never going to pass it. He doesn't know what you're talking about. And this guy's voting. And he's not even up to saying, what's this House of Representatives? Then you have to explain the structure of the American government. Oh, you mean there's one bunch of guys over here and they both have to pass it? Yes. Oh, no wonder it's so hard to get a law passed. They don't have a clue. And that's generally where our society is going. It's dumbing down. I've been watching this for years. I noticed in the 90s there was a big change. I've hired a lot of people in my life. I, I was a businessman. You hire somebody, they move, guy moves on, and you need another guy. Yeah. I noticed a big change in the 90s. So I'd have young people coming into me. They couldn't write in script. They could barely write at all. I'd say something to them and they'd get this blank look. They had no idea what I was talking about. So those were like people born after 1970. Different group of people. Because the society had gone so far down, the school system had deteriorated, dumbing it down. Between the drugs and the school system, they're dumbing them down and doping them up. Dumbing them down and doping them up. That's what it's about. That's why the United States is collapsing. The people who actually knew what they were doing, Henry Kissinger just died. He was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant man. Yeah. I think he wrote like 35 books. I listened to him speak many times. He was a very insightful guy on almost anything. It didn't matter what subject it was that I heard him speak on. He always had something smart and insightful to say. Who's going to replace him? We don't have statesmen anymore. When I looked at someone like Churchill, and people have their opinions about him, but he was a statesman. Yes. Kiss is a statesman. Whole, his whole life to the English government. And that's evident what you're saying. I see that too. And when I look at some of the social media platforms and the way people are speaking on them, which is usually very fast, and the explanations are not erudite, they're not clear, they're not concise. They don't give you a thorough explanation. It's not cogent. Let me tell you, you want to have a good laugh? Go back and listen to Jack Kennedy, okay? He's all over the internet. He was a smart guy. I mean, like he would be interviewed and you can see he would really think and he would give a meaningful answer. Compare that to Joe Biden, same political party. He's stumbling, fumbling, grumbling, bumbling, and mumbling. Everything he says, it's like the lights are on, but nobody's home. It's like the same political party. You can cross section of American society. That is what happens. For example, William F. Buckley had a show for 30 years called Firing Line, where he would interview people, which I watched often. And the, mostly the people he interviewed were people who had the opposite opinion from him. So you got to hear both sides in an intelligent and articulate way. So he would interview somebody like Noam Chomsky. These are two very smart men. And you got to hear why they have the positions they have. There was no name calling. There was no emotion in it. It was just two intelligent people talking. So that show to me was like manna from heaven. I love that show. There's nothing like that now. That's when you have open, respectful dialogue as distinct right. from trying to win an argument. I'm going to make you wrong so I can be right as distinct from providing practical, sustainable solutions.